Good morning. Today's scripture reading is Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 9. 19, 1 through 9. On the first day of the third month, after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from the from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, and they said, That is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell them, people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully, and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for a kingdom of priests and holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Then Moses said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud, so that people will hear me speaking with you, and I'll always put you in their trust. And then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. got a bit chaotic during that scripture reading, didn't it? Boy, what a wonderful chaos to have within the assembly, by the way. Uh, those that have youngins that are making such noises, what a blessing it is. It's never, never a, a hindrance to us here. I, I have a Bible to present. If you remember, Logan Sturcio a couple of weeks ago was baptized into Christ. Logan, can I have you come down here? I know it's right at the first of the lesson kind of putting you on the spot. But we want to present to you a Bible. I have within the front cover, the, of course, the elders have signed, but we have the passage from 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. Come on up, my friend, where it says, uh, Don't let anyone look down upon you for your youth, but to set the believers an example. And we desire for you to take this Bible, and as it says in Timothy, 1, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved to God like a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There you go, brother man. We love you. Uh, one nation under God is where the children of Israel are, as God has worked with them at this point within their history. And he has made it clear to them that they are his chosen people. How do they know that they are his chosen people? Well, he said, I carried you on eagle's wings out of the land of captivity. But he says, you have some obligations to me because of what I have done for you. You are to obey my will and to keep my covenant. And if you will do that, then you, out of all other nations, will be my special possession, my treasured one. I will make out of you a royal priesthood, a holy nation. How can you be sure that I'm going to keep up my end of the bargain? He said, well, the proof is in, not the pudding, but the eating of the pudding is the way that that saying goes, by the way. It's, anyways, the proof is in the pudding. God says, look at what I did. Look at what I have done to the Egyptians. And so we clearly see that God was teaching a lesson to the Egyptians, but he was also teaching a lesson to his people as well, because they were going to be ones who were to trust him and were to follow him and understand that only in him was their deliverance. We looked last week, I mentioned Usher's calendar or timeline here is kind of placed on a timeline for you, but we discussed how the children of Israel were within the land of captivity for about 200 years. Uh, it was during that time, of course, initially with Joseph coming down uh, and the family getting established in the land of Egypt after there was a famine in the land of Canaan. And so they probably weren't in captivity that full 210 years, but they have reached a point where God sent to Moses or saying to Moses through the burning bush, I have heard the cry of my people. They have reached a point where they know that they are in need of a savior. And God says, I have heard their cries and their pleas. He says, am I keeping up my end of the bargain? Well, that's evident. Here is your end of the bargain. You must listen to the decrees that I have given you, those directives, you must obey my commands. Is it good to listen to the Lord? Well, that's already evident for them, isn't it? To be a kingdom of priests, is that a, a wonderful thing? To be a royal priesthood, a, a holy nation. 
Well, they at least, at, on the outset, they agree with this. And in uh, Exodus chapter 19 and verse 8, they say, we will do all that the Lord has commanded. That's in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 8 that we just read. But you and I know, like what Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story, don't we? And we know that though this is a pledge that is much like a young bride and groom that are coming together and devoting their young love, saying till death do us part, at least for the moment we know that they are intentional, but perhaps, you know, life doesn't turn out quite like what they expected. There's only one difference in this husband and wife relationship is that God means what he says and he knows what the future holds and God is able to do and to accomplish and to fulfill every promise that he makes to his people. And so we have a quite unique relationship of a husband and wife here. But that's what I want you to see as we go through the lesson again today is to see God as he takes a nation up under his wing and calls them to belong to him, a kingdom of priests, his own possession a holy nation is that God is pledging a love that is enduring. But in the process, we know of the naivete of the bride, the ignorance in which she possesses, even within spiritual matters. I mean, after all, what has Israel been exposed to for the last centuries or decades leading up to? And we saw this last week as we looked at those gods of Egypt and how the plagues corresponded to their perceived powers and that they were probably very familiar with those gods and yet God was demonstrating that he alone was Jehovah, that I am the eternal one, I am the self-existent one. When a bride and a groom, they pledge their love, their vows generally say such things as till death do us part to have and to hold, to love and to ch cherish in richer and poor, in sickness and in health, for better or for worse. And I think that those vows are made with sincerity. I, don't, I have counseled several before they were married and officiated their wedding, and, and never have I had one, but I do know of ministers who have sat down and counseled once that said, oh, well, if it doesn't work out, then we'll just get a divorce. I mean, what kind of an attitude is that going into a marriage? I want you to see the marriage contract here. You may not see it within these terms of a marriage contract, but basically the Ten Commandments is a marriage contract between the bride and the groom. Thou shalt have no other gods before you. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Okay, those first four in the category all by themselves. I removed it from there. Can you finish them? Do you know what the rest of them are? Okay, we have the first four. No other God before me, right? Don't make into thee any graven image. Don't take my name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I, know, I don't care if you get them in order, but I do want you to just think what comes next. Honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not covet. The marriage contract. The first four deal with my relationship with God. The last six deal with my relationship with my fellow man. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Don't make into thee any graven image. Don't take my name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, my relationship with God. Honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt not murder, commit adultery, steal, lie, or covet. That is my relationship with my fellow man. Why would God emphasize more commandments in my relationship with you in this marriage contract than he would with him. Well, what does God know about us that we quite often can't see? Religion is relationship. Relationship with him and also relationship with you. You cannot divorce the two and have pure religion undefiled before God. In fact, James uses that phraseology, doesn't he? In James chapter 1 and verse 27 when he says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their distress, the last six, right? Justice, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. My relationship with God, those first four, righteousness, a covenant of life. You ever taken swim lessons? You give your kids 
swimming classes whenever they were young, we had Ethan and Emma in the swimming pool, probably before they could ever remember they were in the swimming pool. They had floaties on and they, they had that unique kind that kind of wrap around you to where you could just toss them in. Maybe that was your experience on learning how to swim. Your dad just picked you up by the seat of your britches and tossed you in. It was like sink or swim for your life, boy, right? <laughs> Why do we teach swim lessons? Have you ever taken a survival course? Have you ever learned how to take care of yourself? If you ever get lost out in the wilderness, how to be able to find shelter, to keep warm, perhaps to live off the land if you need to, why would you take such a class, a survival course, or perhaps a personal defense course? Well, we know what those things are all about. You learn those lessons that those courses have to offer within the environment that they are designated for. And if you listen to them, then you have life, or at least you have the opportunity for life. That doesn't always mean that it translates because even those that are most knowledgeable are not always the wisest whenever it comes to action. It's not always, uh, our knowledge isn't always at the forefront of our mind whenever we are out doing. But in a covenant of life, we seek to have life and to secure it in order to survive. I believe that what God is presenting to his people is life itself. This is not a set of rules and regulations. And by the way, we're not just looking at the 10, right? As we look at the law, if you continue to read in the book of Exodus, do you know how many laws there are within the books of law? There's over 600 different ones. As you go through, there's a whole lot of laws that God established. And some people might look at all of those laws and see that like bondage, almost like some view marriage. Oh, the old ball and chain. I think the way that we need to see as God gives these lessons is that God is teaching his people how to swim, that God is teaching his people how to defend themselves. He's teaching them how to survive. Why do so many of them relate to their relationship with one another is because they are no longer going to be individual sets of families, but they are becoming a nation that is united, and if it will, if they will, listen to God, they will become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A nation that not only honors God, but loves their fellow man. And what nation would not be blessed to have such? By implication, God is saying, I bore you on angel wings, or on eagle's wings, obey me, follow my commandments, and you will remain Free. I have delivered you from bondage so that you may walk in liberty, but not in liberality. Do you understand the difference between the two? It's in liberty, not in licentiousness. It's liberty in righteousness, not liberty in lasciviousness or debauchery. Walking with me if you would have life. Learn and live. So oftentimes we use that phrase and we hear that phrase in the opposite, right? We live and then we learn. And it's almost as though, you know, we have to have the life experiences and maybe we, we learn a few lessons from those things and maybe we don't. God says that's no way to approach life. Let me tell you, as you are a people standing here at the foot of the mountain pledging your love to me, learn my law and then you will know how to live. It's not a matter of the experiences on my part, and that's so often the way that we approach life today. You know, what have we learned? What have we experienced? How do you perceive it? What are your thoughts? What do you say? God says, no, you learn from me, and then you will know how to live. This song is taken from our songbook in number 273. But I want you to imagine Mount Sinai, the people there at the foot of the mountain, as the children of Israel are receiving the first of the commandments from God, and then Moses goes back up onto the mountain. And as they stand there, surrounding the mountain with a border that goes around the bottom that says that if anybody crosses it, whether it be man or beast, you, you will die. They are wearing the gold and the silver and the precious gems and the garments of their slave masters. And I want us to just for a moment keep an innocent and pure concept as this. But as they stand before that mountain, they are pledging their love. It's like a young bride who has come down the aisle all in white with her bouquet representative of all that is pure and devoted. And so the children of Israel stand before God and perhaps we could even hear such words come off of their mouth as they say to God, Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds and nothing I desire. 
compares to you. Doesn't that sound like a young bride pledging her love to her husband-to-be, saying, yes, you are everything to me. Yes, I will learn. Yes, I will listen. Yes, I would have life. Yes, I would walk with you. Yes, 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 yes. But we know the rest of the story, don't we? We know the fickleness of their heart. We know that the heart is deceitful above all else. It's amazing the passages that we have been looking at in Exodus are mirrored within the New Testament. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Think again of what God said he would do with them, what kind of nation that they would be. Thinking again of one nation under God. And Paul, or Paul, Peter's not talking to a physical DNA Israelite. Who is he talking to? He's talking to us. And he says to Christians, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Is that not taken directly from Exodus chapter 19 that we had read? Can you hear it? Are we then? Standing at the foot of that mountain in our white robes, pledging our love. Well, is God to us more beautiful than silver? Is he greater to us than gold? Is he the greatest than any other possession that we could ever desire? Here, Peter says that's the way that it should look. And the reason for that, that God has taken it, us in, he says, so that we might declare the praises of him who calls us out of darkness into his wonderful light. I'm sure that you have spent some time with newlyweds, those who are freshly back from their honeymoon, one who has just had a wedding, and maybe you have got to sit down with a bride as she has just come back from her wedding, and all she can talk about is her husband and, oh, how much love that she is in. And ladies, that feeling never leaves you, does it? Ah, you always feel that way about your husband, don't you? Here, God says, you have married me, I have chosen you, I have brought you into my embrace so that you might declare your love for me everywhere that you go, so that you might call my praises in a world of darkness. Do you remember what it was, the lesson that Pharaoh learned last week from Exodus chapter 9 and verse 16? Whenever God said to him, but indeed for this reason, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name throughout the earth. Is this not the exact same lesson? You say, now wait a minute. Preacher, you're, you're kind of mixing your metaphors. You have gone from a newlywed, uh, a, a bride to a rebellious heathen king. And that's right. How can you associate those two? Well, the bride is going to be proclaiming the glory of God within the darkness. The point is, every single one of us, every single one of us, in one way or another, God's name will be proclaimed, whether I be Pharaoh or priest, whether I be disciple or demon, whether I be a friend or foe, God will be praised. That, that might cause you some consternation because you think to yourself, well, now wait a minute, I am thinking of somebody who is a rebel, I'm thinking of somebody who is a demon, I'm thinking of somebody that makes even Pharaoh pale in comparison, and I don't see how that they could proclaim God's name by their bad example, they support what God has already established. Even when Israel was walking in sin, God proved true and gracious and merciful. Even whenever they were carried off into captivity by other nations, those nations heard the witness. And the witness was this, you either obey God or you are going to pay the price. God be praised because he is always true and he always fulfills everything that he says. He is the one and only true God and even in punishment God was showing his love. For all those that he loves, he rebukes and chastens. Isn't that not what he says, the Hebrew writer in chapter 12? So did he not love Pharaoh as well? Do you agree with this statement that I have up on the board? That God will be praised? that God will be honored, that he will be glorified by every life that is lived, regardless of whether you are in a right relationship with God or not, he will be praised. You will either be an example, one way or another, of how to live or how not to live, of how being one who is obedient, obeying those commandments of God, listening to his will, or being one who is a stiff-necked, rebellious individual who refuses to follow him. But God's name will be praised, and his truth will continue to ring out whether I prove faithful or not. God's truths prove true whether I prove faithful or not. 
You know, it's not God said it and I believe it and therefore it's true. No, it's God said it, therefore it's true. I can complement it by believing in him. I can obey and I can walk with him and glorify him. Ten things that we can do to reset our nation. That's what I have out on a sign on the side of the building. I'm not going to ask how many of you saw that sign and then you thought, oh boy, here he goes again. But I also have referenced the passage of scripture of Exodus chapter 20. Ten things that we can do to reset our nation. Now, I know that I am making an assumption, not in as, as big of an assumption on your part, but, but on those that drive by. I'm making the assumption that they believe that the nation also needs to be reset, and that's not necessarily something that they believe. I know. You, you remember uh, the Great Reset that <laughs> was all being talked about? Here, or, or maybe the reset button with, with Russia? I, I think if they can use it, I'll use it too, okay? But technically, I'm not talking about 10 things, am I? Because the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, has now been transformed into honoring Christ on the first day of the week. And so the seventh day, keep it holy, is now the first day of the week. But if you were to look at those nine commandments that we had before, replace the fourth commandment of on, uh, remember the Sabbath day with uh, honoring Christ on the first day of the week, then what would you have? Have no other gods before me. Don't make any graven image. Don't take my name in vain. Assemble together on the first day of the week. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Don't, don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. And what does that say? That says those things are the most important things still within a society. Does it not? If we had a country of people who just live by those, what would we have? We would have a country that honored God, those first four, and then that they loved one another, those last six in relationship. Whenever Jesus was asked, what is the greatest of commandment? Remember what he said, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's, there's the first four, right? And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not lie, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not covet. Can you see it? No other God before me, no graven image. There's no commandment greater than these after that. The building of a nation, a nation that is going to be in a right relationship with God. If every man followed Jesus' teaching, would we not have a godly and just society? Can you argue with that? If every person would simply listen to and obey the teachings of Christ, you would have everyone that loved God and loved their neighbor as themselves. A nation that is under God is united. A nation that is under God understands its place. A nation that is under God has leaders that listen to what God has to say, godly and just. Remember how I carried you on eagle's wings. God says, I am your deliverer. Let us remember that we have a savior. We have a deliverer. His name is Jesus. And he didn't deliver us out of the bonds of Egypt and from the manacles of making mud bricks and, and building cities. But he did relieve us from the bond of sin, of us yielding ourselves to our flesh, uh, fleshly desires and finding within ourselves not life, but death surrounding us. And Jesus came and God even uses this phraseology in Hosea chapter 11 in verse 1 when he says, Out of Egypt I have called my son. And of course that's in reference to uh, calling Jesus after his parents and he had fled to Egypt. But also the implication is that the sons of God are called out of that figurative bondage into a right relationship with him. We should love him. We should do what we have pledged that we would do. For him, And we should honor him because he is such a wonderful husband and loving Lord. We should be willing to do those things that God says. But from time to time, we need to be reminded that he is to be feared. It wasn't a pleasant scene there at the foot of that mountain. There was the, the thunder. There was the trumpet blast that grew louder and louder. There was the cloud. There was the earthquake. There was the boundary that did say, if you cross this and you are not, you will die. And God stoked fear and reverence into the heart of those individuals in a time that they needed to know who Jehovah was, that he is the eternal one, that yes, he is self-existent, just as Christ, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I really am not trying to make a political statement, 
by putting that out there. But this is a spiritual call on my part to honor those things that I have pledged to God. Those vows that I have made to him, may I renew them on a daily basis so that I can be to him a special possession, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own choosing. But that requires for us to hold up our end of the bargain too. God says, I have carried you on eagle's wings out of bondage, but this is going to require for you to proclaim my name in the darkness. Are you doing so? Have you begun to do that in the watery grave of baptism, call upon his name? Or after having done so, have you walked away? Won't you come this morning? Either way, as we stand and as we sing.